Well, good morning, everybody. Hi. Um, so, welcome to this. What's the first of... Who knows? Maybe there'll be lots of these. Um, we'll have to see how it goes. Um, apologies if the video's a bit choppy. Um, it's about as um, good as I can get from home. Hope you can hear me all right. Um, also, the other thing that we found out this morning um, is that disabling uh, Windows Updater so your computer doesn't sound like it's about to take off um, would also be a very good idea. Um, so apologies for a bit of the background hum there. Um, as you can see on the side of the screen there, um, if you type into the live chat, um, it pops up on the screen as well. Um, that's basically because it's uh, you can't save the live chat. So um, because I'm going to be recording this, hopefully, providing it doesn't all go horribly wrong, um, the idea is that um, you'll be able to see the chat um, when we get to um, to record uh, to recording it for people who are watching it later. But anyway, thank thank you very much for joining us. We've got um, we've got about 25 people on board at the moment, um, so that's all very nice. Um, so let's crack on. The idea is this is going to be about half an hour. We'll see how we get on. Um, it's it's definitely going to be a bit kind of um, at speed. Um, we, and also, yes, just to check, test out the live stream, make sure everything's fine. <clears throat> uh, it seems to be going okay right now. Um, but let's see what we can do. So, as we all know, the draft rules for the 2021 apprenticeship um, funding came out two days ago. Um, there's a seven page changes document, which is kind of, you know, I think is a good thing. Um, better that than them not telling us everything that they've changed. Um, looking at it, it's mainly clarifications. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's been either um, said in other documents um, or said um, said in certain places in the in the guidance that they're repeating in multiple places so it's easier to see exactly what's going on. Um, uh, the, the classic example of that is the thing about um, commitment statements and apprenticeship agreement needing to be two separate documents um, which has been in various places in the rules over the last couple of years um, but they've made a, that kind of increasingly clear um, that um, that's something so we already know that this is a thing that you need to do um and it's, they've just kind of clarified it um i've picked out six six um interesting things um that i think will slash may um leads to us having to change the way we do things um could be worse could be a lot worse um so we're, we're mainly looking at um, continuation of what we've done this year. Um, and actually, a couple of the changes are, I would say, definitely um, good things um, that will help us out. Um, but of course, the, the, the key point that we need to remember that this is the draft version. We do not change our policies now. We wait until actual version one comes out. Um, for those of you who have been around for a couple of years, you may remember when they put out the document that said, oh, yeah, no, off the jobs um, based on 30 hours a week, no matter how many hours a week you work, which was wrong. Um, there's one of these that I'm hoping they see sense on and and go back to, to how the current rules worded that we'll get to in a bit. Um, but yes. Oh, hello, there's a big question. Hi. Sorry, just bear with me a second. Also, the other thing to note is that I'm kind of 30 seconds ahead of you, so where you're typing things, um, it comes up um, separately. Um, um, no, Sharon, you, you, you're right there. They are two separate documents for two separate groups of people. Um, what... Um, has happened in some providers is for ease um, they've made one big word document that's the whole thing um, that's only got one set of signatures at the bottom um, the key thing is to to have it as 
two separate things for your commitment statement and your apprenticeship agreement with two separate bits of signatures. Um, so that's the idea of, of, of making it clear in the rules. A lot of people, I think, are doing it right, um, particularly over the last 18 months when it's been pretty clear in the, in the audit guidance as well. Um, but um, uh, yes, just effectively have it as two separate things that you staple together rather than one big long thing, even if on your system it's one word file. Um, it's kind of the key point there. So you've got two separate bits of signatures. So the employer and you are agreeing to a bunch of things and the employer, the apprentice and you are agreeing to a bunch of things. Um, hooray, good. Um, so let's see what we've got. I, I've done this in the order they appear in the, um, in the rules rather than in order of importance or anything. Um, so we'll kind of bip and bop around the, the various different bits. Um, so this is an interesting one. Paragraph, paragraph 41, they've taken out, when, when you're calculating minimum duration, there was a thing about temporary part-time working that said you had to, to calculate that in, that they've taken out. And I'm not sure by taking that out if it means we don't have to do it anymore or if it's um, if it's kind of if they think it that the calculation's kind of an ongoing thing. So this is a thing to look at. <clears throat> I don't have an answer on this one yet. Um, some of this is a bit more straightforward, but this one is just a weird thing that um, we need a bit more clarity on. Excuse me. Um, so what I'll get to at the end, the, the important thing about this document is they want us to get back to them and say, um, I'm not quite sure about this. It looks clear. Is it clear? Um, and we, we know, otherwise, you know, FE Connect wouldn't exist if the rules were perfect, right? The service desk wouldn't exist if the rules were perfect. Where we've got this stuff that doesn't quite make sense they're giving us the, the opportunity this week, um, I think the closing date's next Friday, to get an email into them and say, what about this? Um, I've done mine. <laughs> um, it wasn't short. Um, so yeah, there's there's uh, an opportunity here to, to tell them we don't understand a thing and hopefully it might help. So that's that's just a little one there. We'll, we'll see how we how it goes on that one. Now, this is a really good bit. Um, marginally complicated, but really useful, I think, um, although there's, there's some issues. So they've put this new section in, which has been, was hidden away in the off the job hours document for a bit. And then on a webinar about three months ago um, that I only found, thanks to Martin West, thanks Martin, um, there's, um, what it's about is where you've got a learner on a long apprenticeship, so definitely more than 372 days. If you've got somebody on a two-year apprenticeship, let's say, 24 month, but after 18 months, they've done everything. Um, they're, they're competent, they're ready to go, they're ready to be put in for endpoint assessment. And the issue here, of course, is to do with the 20% of the job hours calculation, because you do that cal calculation at the start based on the 24 months. So the issue has been where people are just quick learners or f not where you've got the APL wrong, not where you've um, done weird things, um, not where they've kind of semi done stuff, but where they're just legitimate fast learners and they've got through everything they need to in less time than you suspect. Um, it can also happen where it's the first time you've delivered a standard and you think it's probably going to be about this and it turns out it's a bit faster. So there's been a lot of back and forth about this in terms of what we do to make that learner, make sure that learner's eligible when the number of OT off the job hours they've done is only 18 months worth. And this new section makes it really straightforward and really clear. And there's even a flowchart because what, we, what we've discovered over the last couple of years is putting flowcharts in is a good thing. So go away and have a look at it. Um, it, it 
I tried copying it into the um, presentation and it's just too small, so it, it, it wouldn't make sense. But the, clear, the, the key bit is this. So when you're delivering over a short duration, so our, uh, our example here, our, our learner who's got through it all in 18 months, if you've got evidence to show that for that 18 months, they did 20%, and you, they, they've got that 20% hours, then the learner is, va is valid and eligible for funding. It doesn't matter that there's another six months that they haven't done the number of hours for. Now, you've still got to meet minimum... So this, this slide here, this is sp exactly what it says in the middle of the flowchart. So it's still got to meet the minimum duration, but it gives us an opportunity to have eligible learners um, who have, who are quick learners um, be put in for EPA at an appropriate point. And the, the, the second part of this is to do with the, um, the evidence requirements for this. You need a signed thing from the employer and the apprentice saying everything's been done, the learner's ready to go to endpoint assessment, we're fine with it, um, on we go. Now, this will be audited to within an inch of your life because what we're, what we're, what's happening here is these are learners who, to whom we are delivering a lower number of OTJs than planned. So when we fill in the new actual off-the-job hours field for these learners, that value will be lower, in some cases significantly lower, than the planned number. Um, so this is a really interesting twitch, uh, twist on the on the twenty percent rule, um, and because of that, by gum, belt braces, another belt, some more braces. Um, where you are doing this for learners, and it's the right thing to do for these learners, then make sure your paperwork is absolutely one hundred percent complete and accurate. Otherwise they'll just have the money off you. It's pretty straightforward. If you can't show that, um, A, the amount of hours you delivered is 20% off for the actual time on programme, and you haven't got the um, the evidence they're asking for, it's an easy win for an auditor. Um, so let's, so, um, sorry Mel. <laughs> Yeah, they still haven't got back to me about that thing about the OPPs, Mel. Um, I chased it up a couple of times, and and I and we haven't got to the bottom of it. Um, there, theoretically, the funding document says that those OP those OPPs should be paid when you set them to complete. Um, I know it's not happening in your case. Um, so we need to keep an eye on that. Um, I know a couple of other people have reported it, um, and I'll put it on. I'll put it on my list of things to chase up with the service desk. This is not a short list, um, but I, I think this, in general, is is a really good clarification and really good um, way it's set out in the rules. So take time to go and read through those. I mean, it's three paragraphs. It's a page and then another page for the. Um, for the flowchart, so that's a good thing. We like this one. What have we got next? Okay, apprenticeship bonuses, um, incentive payments, bonuses, whatever we want to call them. Um, these are the bonuses announced by the Chancellor a couple of weeks ago. So that's our extra thousand quid for the um, uh, 16 to 18s. Uh, sorry, extra 2,000 quid for the 16 to 18s um, and the uh, extra, the other extra payments. Um, now, interestingly, the rules link. Well, actually, they don't. The rules point to the document that came out last week. That's got the the apprenticeship funding rules. That's the other one down in the description. Um, <laughs> the, the rules don't actually currently point to the right document. Classic. Um, but the. Interesting things about this are all of it says that the bonuses will uh, will be paid through the apprenticeship service. 
Now, it's not clear. It, it talks about being paid directly from the apprenticeship service, which is something that's never happened before. Um, so as, as of right now, today, 17th of, of July, we do not know how these bonuses will be paid to the employer, but it doesn't look like they're coming through us. So there's a couple of interesting things here. This means that where you have a non-levy contract, employers who use that and don't have any contact with the apprenticeship service at all won't be paid these bonuses, which is interesting. Um, sorry, Dave, what were we saying? Um, Correct, yes, it's all magic money tree time. We are very much in the centre of magic money tree. Um, the, these, um, these AS payments um, are from a, a separate pot of money. Um, and one way of looking at it is it's a, it's a carrot rather than a stick to get more employers to use the apprenticeship service. <clears throat> now, we know as providers that um, if you're a very small employer, getting involved with government bureaucracy is not the great greatest thing for you you've got your business to run but if you're going to get three grand out of it then maybe that's a bit of a carrot to get you to sign up um, and again where you've got um, a contract for non-levies it's probably a good idea to focus that on existing employees because obviously the bonuses aren't paid for existing employees only for those who are new to the business um, or I think the, the precise wording is haven't worked for the employer in the last six months. So there's, there's a bit of something on there. But, um, but yes, focus your non-levy contracted spend <clears throat> um, on the existing employees and where people have new employees um, and we want to get these bonuses, those people are going ha to have to go through the apprenticeship service. Um, Darren, yes, that is the next question. So, the document strictly uh, says quite clearly there's no limit on the incentive payments a single employer can get. But the document also says, and and there's a whole range of reasons that the each employer can only have ten. Any non-levy employer can only have ten learners on the apprenticeship service at any one time, which has gone up from three this week, literally yesterday. Um, so what they're trying to do here is balance out um, uh, risk, the risk of somebody signing up a whole bunch of apprentices, getting a whole bunch of money and then going bust, disappearing, um, just committing basic fraud. Um, and the ability to support employers to to d deliver on what the chancellor said last week. So there's there's definitely a thing here. Um, um, uh, yes, Dave. The actual app funding is from the same magic money tree. Uh, the actual app funding itself is from the the magic money tree. The the idea being that, of course, come. Theoretically, although we've said this before, come uh, next March, there will be no contracts anymore. Everything will be through the apprenticeship service. Um, or certainly every new start will be through the apprenticeship service. Obviously, there'll be, there'll be contracts for, um, for carrying learners for, God, what, four years probably? Um, so, so these apprenticeship bonuses, um, it's worth getting your head about around how you're going to approach the employers that you're working with or hoping to work with um, about these things and working out how much extra time you're going to have to spend helping them set up their apprenticeship service account and getting that all ready. Um, so yes, this is something that's, of course, as it's something announced a week ago, um, it's something that's going to um, uh, be in progress for the next few months. Um, obviously, it's only a six-month window that this bonus is payable for. Um, morning, Matt. That's the boss. Look busy, everybody. Um, so, paragraph 271. So, you'll remember in January, the rules were altered 
for learners who um, leave an employer. So for everybody who isn't made redundant, so whether they're sacked, whether they choose to leave, um, whatever. The, for the last three years, the rules have said there cannot be a gap in employment. Somebody has to finish with one employer on a Friday, start with the next one on a Monday. And if it's not that, it's a withdrawal. And then in January, they changed the rules so that there's a 30 day, what I've called a grace period here, for an employee to move um, from one employer to another. And there's a little bit of a gap in there that allows us to get the apprenticeship up and running with the new employer. All very sensible, makes sense. Um, that initial rule in January talked about using a break in learning for the gap in employment, which, OK, fair enough. However, and this is this is the one I want you to get onto the apprenticeship service about to to say, say this doesn't make sense. They've changed it on Para two seven one in this version of the rules to say this should be managed with a withdrawal rather than a break in learning. Now this is a big problem because learners who withdraw learners who aren't made redundant who leave one employer and start another, even where they're flagged as a restart, aren't exempt from the minimum duration rule. So where you've got this gap in employment and somebody um, starts with a new employer, if it's marked as a withdrawal, that new apprentice apprenticeship with the new employer must be 372 days if it's a withdrawal. Now, what they might have done is forgotten to add an exemption into the exemption categories because, for example, where somebody's made redundant, um, the minimum duration no longer applies. Um, if they've been made redundant when they start with a new employer, um, and we'll come on to some interesting things about that in three slides time. Where they've, where they've been made redundant and have moved to a new employer, the minimum duration doesn't apply. But where they've been sacked or where they've left of their own choice or any other situation that isn't redundancy, the minimum duration rules still apply to the new employer. So I'm hoping that they've got something wrong here, that they've just not quite seen what they've said. Please, please email them and tell them this, because as we saw with the AEB rules, if enough people do it, they change things. So th this is our bit of activism for the day. Um, and again, this is why you don't change your processes based on the draft rules, because this could be a big issue if you've got learners in this, in this um, situation, where we don't want to do it now until it's categorically definitely in the rules. Good. Speaking of redundant um, apprentices, we are, we are being tasked with creating a record of achievement. And those of, those of us from the 90s, who are, or at least those of us who were at school in the late 90s and early, um, late 80s, early 90s, will remember the um, red leatherette um, folder. I would have got mine out, but it's right in the back of a cupboard. But I have still got it. Um, called the record of achievement. And um, slightly facetiously, this is what they want to do where apprentices have been made redundant. So, if you've got somebody who's been made redundant and who's leaving you um, and who doesn't, who can't complete, um, so somebody who's been made redundant um, and is too far from the end to complete within the rules as they currently stand, what they're asking us to produce is a lovely thing for them to hang on to for when they go to, where they do find a new employer who is willing to take them on as an apprentice. Um, hopefully this is visible. It's quite a long list, um, but it, it, it's kind of pretty straightforward stuff. So it's what kind of apprentice it is and what level it is. Um, the KSBs they've developed and evidenced, I'll come back to those two in the middle, the, the two in the middle of the interesting ones. And where there's mandatory calls in the apprenticeship, um, <laughs> Oh, sorry, Dave. I didn't mean to um, get two ages there, but those of us um, 
In the prime of our lives, we'll certainly have um, had one. Um, um, so and where there's mandatory qualifications, stuff that people have already achieved. So if it's a, if it's a unit based and there's a bunch of units that they've already done and are passed. So that this is good because if you're a receiving, if you're a receiving provider and somebody comes to you um, who's been made redundant and six months ago, um, then we can see what they've done. Now, what I found, um, sorry, are we, are we chatting about exciting things? Um, oh, thank you. Yes, I, I think you're right, Sharon, that, that, that this, is a, this is a positive step forward and makes um, is more likely to lead to people halfway through picking up again because they'll have something that they can, something tangible that they can show a new provider. But what I found with providers who've been taking on people from other places is the thing that we struggle with as a provider is knowing what that total, the maximum of that total negotiated price can be because the learner will have, gener will have generated X amount of funding for the initial provider. And it's an absolute pig to work out what that number is when you're setting your TMP. This should, should help. Because if we've got the start date and planned end date, and we know, we can guess that where a learner didn't have an ARLP at the beginning, we can guess what the initial provider charged, because it's almost certainly going to be the maximum band value. And we know the percentage of the apprenticeship completed, which, I mean, they may as well just put actual end date in there. But that'll give us where it's a 18 month apprenticeship if they've completed 50% of it will know they've had, you know, that that's the, the, the kind of easy sum. We'll know they've had roughly half the funding. So we'll know where to start our TMP discussions at. Um, slightly facetiously in my comments to um, the apprenticeship service, I said, can you maybe just add amount of funding the learner has generated into this list? Because although it's although the, the, the it's of no use at all to the apprentice themselves, it would be really useful to a receiving provider. Um, like I say, I'm working with a, a couple of providers who've been having issues with this and trying to um, reverse engineer it from the information on the indicative funding report that comes from SLD, not the one in FIS, just the SLD one, um, is not a fun game. Um, uh, so the, the simpler we can make that calculation for receiving providers the better I think um, so that anyway we'll need to have a little um, format set out for this including all of these pieces of information which seems relatively straightforward right um, yeah Sharon that's true I, th I think particularly where we're looking um, that, that we can find that out from the employer DAS account if the employer is nice enough to tell you or understands exactly where to look. You know, I think that's in some of the, um, the problems that um, some providers I've been working with have faced. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, it's quite a, a, a long section for something that probably won't affect a lot of learners. Um, now, apparently these new rules came in um, earlier in the year. This is the first year they're in the actual rule document. Um, and it's about keep in touch days um, that's what kit is keep in touch um, so where you've got learners on various types of um, leave <coughs> um, they can use their keep in touch days for training um, keep in touch days is something that they're built into the um, a maternity pay scheme and other pay schemes where people can so it works for both an employee and an employer that um, they can have um, discussions without affecting their their maternity pay and their other pay um, it's a limited number uh, what's interesting is that any kind of bit of training 
counts as a whole day of, of, of keep in touch day. So even if it's only an hour, that's a whole keep in touch day. And I think this is going to be interesting from a break in learning perspective, because if you've got somebody on maternity, traditionally, they'd have a 12 month break in learning that covers the period, period of maternity leave. If within that, they've got one day here and one day here and one day here, where you're delivering training to them, you have to kind of unbreak them, then rebreak them if there's more than a full week gap there again, and then break them and unbreak them. So I'd Think about this very carefully before you decide that the thing, whilst you may be having um, conversations, etc., with the learner who is on maternity leave, whether you want to consider that to be delivering training because it's going to have... Morning, Nick. Um, it's going to have a whole bunch of implications um, for on a bill, off a bill, on a bill, off a bill. Um, and as we know, breaks in learning are not um, the easiest thing to, to get right and to evidence and to make sure everything's in the file correctly. Um, so there's some rules there. Um, it might be of use to some learners, particularly, I think, more towards the end of their, of their leaves. Um, but just be careful on that one, I think. Um, and yes, so there are our top six. Look at that in, in literally half an hour. Top six um, things that I've spotted um, in the new rules that came out this week. Um, as I said, please don't forget to feed back to the ESFA. It's fundingrules.comments at education.gov.uk. Um, it's at the very top of the, of the clarifications document that you can... Um, Go through and anything that doesn't make sense to you, tell them it doesn't make sense to you. Don't feel like, oh, well, maybe I'm just being daft. Tell them. Because the more people that tell them, then the more likely it is they'll look at it again and try and reword it and hopefully make it clearer. Um, so, yes, um, we've got a bit of time for questions if people want questions. Um if I was some kind of um, young person's YouTuber, if I was some kind of young person's YouTuber, I'd be, say, I'd be saying subscribe to the link below. I think that's that's what they do, isn't it? Um, follow me on Twitter at Steve Hewitt MIS. Um, <coughs> uh, my email address is there as well. It's steve.hewitt at fea.co.uk. I suppose I should at this point do the plugging. Um, uh, FEA is the FE Associates is the company for whom I work. Um, we provide um, uh, consultancy and interim management and executive search facilities um, across um, the, the FE sector. So we have experts in management information, such as myself and my colleagues. Um, we have finance experts. We have curriculum experts. Basically, if there's something that you want help with somewhere in your organisation, I'm sure we'll have somebody who can help you. Um, you know, we've, the company's been going for over 15 years now. Um, we're delivering a lot of great work out there. Um, for those of you who may have seen me or some of my colleagues talking about the Leading from the Middle project with ETF, that's been a great project. Um, if there are any middle managers out there, um, go to the ETF website and look for Leading from the Middle and get on the next run. I'm not quite sure when the next run is, but I know we've been working on... Um, uh, moving it to a fully online kind of thing so um, hopefully it'll be more accessible to more people um, it's been a really great project to work on um, you get 45 minutes of me t telling you exactly how all funding works imagine um, but yes so please get in touch with us if you have any um, requirements out there um, uh, in the current situation um, or if you need any um, help and support um, with any of the um, with any of your your work i think i've lost me goodbye slide never mind um goodbye <laughs> and i've got through the um got through the whole thing without any major technical issues um there is a comment box under the video as well um i'm pretty uh, this has been all right hasn't it we've done okay um <laughs> thanks for the um for, for joining in on the chat as well that's really useful and helpful um 
So I'll, I'll be publishing this. Uh, obviously, if you are watching this not live, then hello, thank you for watching this not live. Um, I did decide to, um, to save it and put it up on YouTube. Um, so with that, I'll say um, have a great weekend, everybody. Um, keep, on keep in touch with me um, on Twitter or in LinkedIn. You can find me quite easily, I think. I don't think there's that many. I mean, there'll be 